Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Welcome to Nolensburg Presbyterian Church, and we are so glad you found us on YouTube. If you are new in worshiping with us for the very first time, we welcome you, and we really hope and pray that you sign in right there under the screen on our YouTube channel, or go to nolensburgchurch.org, and there is a visitors tab on the right-hand side. Click on it, put in your information, and I, Pastor Curtis, will reach out to you sometime this week uh, to introduce myself and to introduce you to Christ Church here at Nolensburg. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel on YouTube, and if you are a social media buff, go to our Facebook page, Facebook backslash Nolensburg. Please like us there. And there's a lot of information that continues to be posted on our Facebook page to get to know uh, about Christ Church and what we do. Nolensburgchurch.org is also filled with our beliefs, what we do. Our conversation about race and faith continues on that web page. Right across the top of the website is a big red banner. And there are wonderful resources there from our national church, uh, from seminaries, to begin difficult conversations about race and faith, and particularly with our children as well. We also offer a 9 a.m. in-person worship experience. It happens right outside uh, in front of our church. There's plenty of space, plenty of shade. Please bring your own chair. We will always wear masks throughout the worship service. And we have a great guest musician and soloists that are helping to lead us in worship. I believe in a few more weeks as well, we will begin to have small talks at these outside worship services. Today, we have a guest preacher. His name is the Reverend Ross Bash, and we are so glad that he is here to preach. Next Sunday on Labor Day weekend, we have Elder John Mordyke preaching. We will also celebrate communion via our virtual worship service and in person. Sunday school will resume September 13th via Zoom. Please look for an email from your Sunday school teacher. Those classes will happen either 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. Your teacher will inform you when your class is happening. We have a special night for the kickoff of Sunday school, Rally Day, later that evening. So Sunday school will begin September 13th in the morning. But later that evening, we will have two food trucks coming from 4 to 7 p.m., an ice cream food truck and a hot dog food truck. At 5 p.m., we'll have a brief prayer service in which we will uh, commission our Sunday school teachers. We'll also give third graders their third grade Bible. And the families whose eldest child turns two, they will receive a family spark Bible. And we use that spark curriculum throughout the year. Uh, I preach on the lectionary, and our kiddos, all of our people really, are on the same page of the Bible week in and week out. Behind us, behind the building, you can come and see, we're almost halfway finished with the tree removal project. And all the trees that remain are marked now with pink tape, so they're easily visible. And we want to thank all the guys. We've had 20, 25 guys show up through the last two or three months. And we thank you for your dedication to Christ Church and your hard work and sweat in removing these trees. Thank you for your help and your dedication. Prayer requests, please call the church office, or you can email nolensburgpresby at comcast.net. There are care cards that remain in the office. If you hear a, a prayer concern that moves in your hearts, you can get those there. Mask ministry continues to happen. There continue to be masks in our office hallway. Loaves and fishes, our emergency food pantry. The best way to support it, financial giving at this point. Our hunger offering for August remains to support the United Presbyterian Church of New Kensington Food Pantry. And we are in the process of nominating elders and deacons of the church. And if you know someone who would serve Christ Church well as a leader, please call the church office or email the elders on the personnel ministry. Friends, we do recognize that this is a difficult season for many of us. Three pandemics systemic racism, COVID-19, and economic uncertainty. A time when many folks may be feeling anxious, depressed, isolated, or lonely. If you, or you know someone, 
who could benefit from regular contact with a person who is trained to be a caring listener and who could offer confidential, spiritual support, please do not hesitate to let me know. We have a committed team of Stephen ministers who are ready and willing to help. Sisters and brothers in Christ, if this worship service blesses you today, please prayerfully consider generously supporting Christ's ministry at Nolensburg. Friends, let us worship the living God. From whirlwind and burning bush, in still of night and in sheer silence, God calls the faithful to sacred work, beckoning us to turn aside, inviting us to stand on holy ground. God welcomes the faithful into sacred space. Come, God is calling. Let us worship the Lord. voices and lift up your praise. Join with the heavens declaring the wonders of his faithfulness forever. Sing of the victory, the hope of the world. The Savior has risen, the Spirit has come to bring us into love forever. God, who hears the cries of the oppressed, you call us to resist evil and hold fast to what is good, to take up the cross and commit our lives to the cause of love. But we are afraid to confront powers that privilege some and diminish others. We do not want to lose the security we enjoy. Forgive us. Open our ears to hear your voice, our eyes to look upon neighbors in need, in our hearts to respond with compassion that we might follow the way of Christ.
the good news of the gospel is we have a God in Jesus Christ who desires to save all the world, who does not desire to condemn it, but to save all of us. Friends, the good news is that you are forgiven in Jesus Christ, but not only you, all the world. Go and forgive and invite others into friendship with God. What's your name? Mason. Mason. Is your name Mason? My name is Miss Nikki and this is Mason. And Nate. You're who? Nate. And we're going to talk about talents. I'm a big boy. You are a big boy. Maybe that's your talent. You're a big boy. But do you know what a talent is? Mm-hmm. What is a talent? I, I don't know. Uh, oh, yeah, it's in the Spark Bible, yeah. But what is your personal talent that God has given you? Oopsie. What? You're being silly. A talent is something you're good at. What are you good at? Are you good at helping Mommy and Daddy? Are you good at um, helping us with the ducks in the morning and getting the eggs? You have so many talents, and everybody has a different talent. But God has given us these talents so we could help each other out. Isn't that fun? Does that make you excited that you could help people with your talents? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think you're a good singer. And a good dancer, and that helps me by making me so happy because you make me smile every time you sing and dance. Isn't that cool? You can make mommy smile, but just by singing. Well, we're going to talk about the parable of the talents in our Spark Bible, and it's on page 316. <clears throat> Jesus told a story about using the gifts God gives us. A man was going on a trip. I need someone to take care of my money, he thought. He called his servants and handed each of them talents. Take care of this money while I'm away, he said. Two of the servants went to the market. They traded their talents and made more. One servant was afraid. He dug a hole and buried his talents. The man returned and two servants handed him more than they had been given. Good job, the man said. You shall have more. The third servant brushed the dirt from his talents. I was afraid, he said. I buried my talent. Give your talents to the others, the man said. You did not use what I gave you. I will not give you any more. So what we learn from this parable is if we don't use our talents that God has given us, I <laughs> 
if we don't use them we and help them. people with them, we, um, them. we uh, won't be granted more talents to help more people. Um, and the man who didn't help, um, didn't do anything with his talents and buried them away and was afraid to use them to help people, um, the man gave them away to other people. So if you don't use your talents, they'll be wasted and you won't be able to help each other with the gifts that God have, has given you. What do you think about that? Um, I do you think you'll start using your talents uh, so you can help people? Yes. Will you start singing and dancing for I, me so I could smile? Well, what you put right there? All right. Let, let's pray real quick. Can you bow your head? Who's over there? Dear Father, uh, please um, help us to use our talents that you have given us to help one, one another. Amen. Hear the word of God in Luke chapter 19 verses 1 through 10. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man there named Zacchaeus, he was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. The Word of God. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, help me stand I am tired, I am weak, I am worn Through the storm, through the night Lead me on to the light And take my hand, precious Lord Lead me home When my way Rose drear, precious Lord, linger near when my light is almost gone. Hear my cry, hear my call, hold my hand lest I fall, and take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. darkness appears and the night draws near and the day is past and gone at the river I stand guide my feet hold my hand and take my hand precious Lord lead me home 
take my hand, lead me on, help me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Through the night, lead me on to the light and take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Today, we welcome Reverend Ross Bash to our pulpit. Reverend Bash has been married to Christiane for 48 years, come this October. They have three children, four grandchildren, and at present, six border collies. He practices law with his daughter, Sarah, with offices in Delmont. Ross is a member of Redstone Presbytery, ordained 1988, and does part-time interim ministry in the Presbytery. He has served 15 churches as an interim minister and has served as legal counsel primarily defense, but also prosecuted in roughly two dozen PCUSA disciplinary and remedial cases throughout the U.S., Presbytery, Synods, and General Assembly. Ross has twice served as solicitor for Redstone Presbytery, totaling 10 years. For multiple years, he has volunteered as a counselor and director at Pine Springs Camp, also negotiated the joint mission operation slash partnership between Redstone and Washington Presbyteries for Pine Springs and handled the camp's nonprofit incorporation. He has served as camp accreditation standard visitor and instructor for multiple years for the camp, American Camp Association for, and for the Boy Scouts of America. He has instructed and been a staff member for multiple years for youth and adult leadership training programs for the Boy Scouts of America. Ross has served on staff for multiple years and also directed a couple of years for the Trinity of the Synod, Trinity, for the Synod of the Trinity's Youth and Government, Youth and Peacemaking, and Faith in Arts Media Expressions Seminaries. We Presbyterians love our acronyms and big long words. Publications include articles in Church and Society magazine, and Seventh Angel Magazine, and also researched and drafted the risk management chapter for the Boy Scouts of America field book. We welcome this day the Reverend Ross Bash. Thanks for coming. The New Testament lesson this morning is from Luke's Gospel in the 19th chapter, verses 11 through 26. Um, the portion that we'll hear this morning is actually in the middle of a longer account. Um, but as you hear these words of Scripture, listen for God's word. As they were listening to this, he went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem, because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. So he said a nobleman went to a distant country to get royal power for himself and then return. He summoned 10 of his slaves and gave them 10 pounds and said to them, do business with these until I come back. But the citizens of his country hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to rule over us. When he returned having received royal power, he ordered those slaves to whom he had given the money to be summoned so that he might find out what they had gained by trading. The first came forward and said, Lord, your pound has made 10 more pounds. He said to him, well done, good slave, because you have been trustworthy in a very small thing. Take charge of 10 cities. Then a second came saying, Lord, your pound has made five pounds. He said to him, and you, and you roll over five cities. Then the other came saying, Lord, here is your pound. I wrapped it up in a piece of cloth. For I was afraid of you because you are a harsh man. 
You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked slave. You knew, did you, that I was a harsh man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow? Why then did you not put my money into the bank? Then when I returned, I could have collected it with interest. He said to the bystanders, take the pound from him and give it to the one who has 10 pounds. And they said to him, Lord, he has 10 pounds. I tell you, to all those who have, more will be given. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. This ends the reading of God's word. God adds blessing not simply to our reading and hearing of the word. God empowers us to go out and to live the word in the world. Amen. Let us pray. Good and great God, give us pure hearts that we may see you, humble hearts that we may hear you, hearts of love that we may serve you, hearts of faith that we may live in you, reverent hearts that we may worship you here and in the world out there, through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Well, first let me say what a pleasure and a privilege it is to uh, worship with you here at Newlandsburg Presbyterian Church and to thank Curtis for that uh, kind introduction. I told his secretary there were shorter things that could have been said, uh, but probably weren't appropriate to say in church. So we'll let that go. The scripture from Luke this morning appears to raise some interesting questions. But all of the questions I suggest come down to really just one primary question. What is in your wallet? What's in your wallet? If that question sounds vaguely familiar, unless you think I came up with it, which I didn't, it's from the TV commercials for Capital One, in which sometimes Jennifer Garner and sometimes Samuel L. Jackson make a sales pitch for the credit card issued by Capital One, a once small and rather obscure bank, truth be told, with a not particularly successful credit card prior to this slogan, and in which Jennifer, smiling sweetly and Samuel, glowering forcefully, look you in the eye and ask, what's in your wallet? I personally prefer Jennifer. With that smile of hers, I think she could even sell me an ice maker in Antarctica. But what you may ask to the contents of your wallet have to do with this scripture, this parable attributed to Jesus in Luke's gospel. On its face, the account in chapter 11 in Luke's gospel is pretty straightforward. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and in the first 10 verses of this chapter, he encounters a fellow named Zacchaeus, of whom we learn three things. First, he's a tax collector. Second, he's rich. And third, and I can identify with this one, he's short. So short that he can't see Jesus over the crowd. So Zacchaeus climbs a sycamore tree in which Jesus spots him, and Jesus invites himself to Zacchaeus' house, which Zacchaeus does joyfully. Meanwhile, the crowd around Jesus gets a bit ticked off. I mean, who likes a tax collector? They grumble about Jesus being the guest of a sinner. Zacchaeus, however, has a complete change of character. He vows to give half of his wealth to the poor and to repay fourfold anyone he has cheated. And Jesus responds in kind, saying that salvation has come to Zacchaeus' house, and also gently chiding the crowd that he has come to seek and to save the lost 
like Zacchaeus. The closing verses of chapter 11 after our passage today describe Jesus going on to Jerusalem in the course of which he sends two disciples to fetch a colt that they will find tied. The Palm Sunday procession into Jerusalem in which Jesus rides the colt and is greeted by a rejoicing throng. Jesus weeping over the city, Jesus driving the moneylenders out of the temple, and finally the chief priests and scribes conspiring against Jesus. In the middle verses of chapter 11, today's passage, which probably occurs with the crowd still at Zacchaeus' house, Jesus tells a parable that ties back into Zacchaeus' situation, focused as it was on money but that also looks forward to the events that will occur in Jerusalem, including perhaps Jesus driving the moneylenders out of the temple. Luke also gives us the inside story that leads into Jesus' parable. He says, they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. Essentially what the crowd cheering Jesus in the triumphal procession into Jerusalem also believed that Jesus coming into Jerusalem was a fulfillment of the messianic promise as they expected it to be with the restoration of their former glory, their nation, their national pride, their national identity, God's kingdom on earth in the tradition of King David, set free from the hated Roman conquerors and occupiers of their nation. And Jesus' parable that follows is basically a morality lesson and a reality check to the crowd. And it's about the kingdom of God. The story is straightforward. A nobleman goes into a far country to receive a kingdom and gives 10 of his servants or his slaves a pound each with which to trade. His citizens, however, send word after him that they do not want him to reign over them. When the nobleman returns having received the kingdom, He asked each of the ten servants how much they've gained in trading each of their pounds. When the first one says he has increased his pound by ten more pounds, the king praises him and rewards him with authority over ten cities. So on with the second servant, who has increased his pound by five more pounds, who also receives then the king's praise and is rewarded with authority over five cities. But one of the servants fesses up and delivers back to the king the single pound he was given, justifying it on the basis of his fear of the king as a severe man, taking what he didn't lay down or deposit, reaping what he didn't sow. And the king, while acknowledging that what the servant says about him is true, belittles and condemns the servant, calling him wicked saying that he should have at least earned interest on the king's money, taking the servant's single pound away and giving it to the one who has ten pounds. And when the others object that, well, he already has ten pounds, the king says to everyone who has, more will be given. But from him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. The king is equally hard on his enemies who did not want him to rule over them. In the verse that follows our lesson this morning, he orders that they be brought before him and be put to death. Now consider, Luke introduces this parable and attributes it to Jesus in relation to the kingdom of God and the crowd's mistaken belief that the kingdom of God was imminent. Clearly, the kingdom of God that the crowd was expecting was not imminent as the events shortly to unfold for Jesus in Jerusalem show. And you no doubt recognize this parable as similar to the one in Matthew's gospel about the talents. But that also raises a problem if the point of this parable is about the kingdom of God. For the outcome here seems to be saying a couple of very uncomfortable things about the kingdom of God. First, is it saying that those who are good at making money, 
Those who are good at gain are the ones who belong in the kingdom of God. And that the ones who aren't good at making money, who fail to make more money, they not only lose what they've got, but they also don't even belong in the kingdom of God. Probably not. It's probably more the case that Jesus grounds the parable in a money context because of the encounter with Zacchaeus. And the fact that within the same chapter, Jesus drives the money changers out of the temple makes clear that he's not really an advocate for mixing money-making and faith. But consider how some preachers, some churches, promote what they call the prosperity gospel. That what God really wants is for us to be rich. So keep those dollars coming. So God will bless you with riches. Or even in a less crass way. How even, how even pastors and churches that don't believe such nonsense still tend to give a subtle but greater deference to, to the biggest givers in the congregation. Is that what the kingdom of God is about? Second, is the parable saying, perhaps in a more subtle or maybe even unintentional way, that our place in the kingdom of God has something to do with rewards. That somehow we get to heaven on the basis of how well we perform on earth. That the Christians who turn one pound into ten pounds get rewarded with the top spots in heaven. Those who turn one pound into five pounds also get rewarded with a spot in heaven, but it's a little bit lower in the ranking. That those who fail to increase the pound at all well, they don't have any place in the kingdom of God. If that's how salvation works, based on a system of rewards, then what's the point of grace? So let me take this a little deeper. Maybe as I suggested, this parable isn't about money as such, although it's been said that you can often tell what a person's values are by the entries in their checkbook. But maybe money is just a generic or a symbolic illustration that Jesus uses here because of the encounter with Zacchaeus. And that Luke also includes it here because of Jesus' subsequent encounter with the moneylenders in the temple. Maybe the deeper question that the parable poses for us is what do we have to give? What do we have to contribute? to help upbuild the kingdom of God. And that being the case, given that all we have is ultimately a gift from God, how do we use what we have? How do we develop and grow our gifts to help upbuild the kingdom of God? Which I suggest is the same question with which I began and it serves as my sermon title. What's in your wallet? Your spiritual wallet? Your faith wallet? We're often tempted to over-spiritualize scriptural lessons and thus miss the obvious. This passage isn't about wealth being morally right or morally wrong, although sometimes it can lead to moral wrong. And if grace means anything, it means that the kingdom of God isn't about rewards or heavenly hierarchies. Now, the real issue Jesus confronts the crowd with is whether we truly give what we have to give. If we have financial wealth, do we give it? Do we use it to help those in need like Zacchaeus did after encountering Jesus? If it's financial or other professional talents, gifts of teaching or of healing, skill with your hands, other forms of service, do we truly use our gifts and talents to serve others? Do we truly dedicate what we have and what we are as Christians to the service of the Lord in church and out? God doesn't hold us responsible for gifts and talents we do not have. 
but God does hold us responsible for gifts and talents we do have. And while we are responsible to God only for what we do have, that also means that we need to be honest about what we have, what gifts and what talents we have. That is, we all need to acknowledge that we have far greater gifts and talents than we are sometimes willing to admit, much less share. Consider, for example, how often gifts and talents in churches are withheld or at least not shared freely and graciously in doing the Lord's work because someone is upset with a fellow church member or is upset with the pastor or there is disagreement about this issue or that issue. When will we not only accept but also act on the fact that each of us has gifts and talents that are not only intended but are essential for the Lord's work, that it is God's work in and through the whole of the church, but also beyond the church, that is meant to be primary in our faith lives. Maybe it's even more clear and straightforward. The pole star of my own faith is a passage from the prophet Micah, in which he asks similar questions of persons of faith. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to show kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Which reminds me of a story, which is from a TV show a few years ago, The West Wing, and with which I'll conclude. In addition to this idea about using our gifts and talents for God's work, it also picks up on Micah's point about doing justice and showing kindness and compassion, walking humbly with our God. Those qualities of life and character that were so profoundly exhibited in the one whose name we bear and of whom we profess to be disciples. The story is about a fellow who, as he was walking, fell into a deep hole. There he was, stuck, unable to get out, when his doctor happened to walk by. The fellow yelled up, hey, doc, I'm stuck down in this hole. Can you help me get out? The doctor looked down, nodded at the guy, wrote him a prescription, threw it down in the hole, and walked on. A little bit later, the fellow's pastor happened to walk by. The fellow yelled up, hey, Rev, I'm stuck down in this hole. Can you help me get out? The pastor looked down, nodded at the guy, wrote him a prayer, threw it down in the hole, and walked on. A little bit later, a friend of this fellow happened to walk by. The fellow yelled up, hey, Joe, I'm stuck down in this hole. Can you help me get out? Sure, said Joe, and with that, he jumped down into the hole. The fellow says, are you nuts? Why did you jump down in this hole with me? Now we're both stuck. And Joe says, it's going to be okay. I've been down here before. I know the way out. If faith means anything, if grace means anything, it means there is a way, even when there seems to be no way out of the hole. That's what discipleship is all about. That's what salvation is all about. That's why God became incarnate, 
to share human life, to share our lives, to go to that cross, to suffer the sin of humankind, to redeem that which had torn asunder the unity of creation, to remind us as a friend while looking up with us out of the deep holes into which our lives sometimes plunge. It's going to be okay. I've been down here before. I know the way out. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, in teaching them to obey everything that I have taught you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Here also, the inspiring words from God's word in Holy Scripture. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. As many of you were baptized into Christ, have now clothed yourselves with Christ, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female, for you are all one in Christ. This promise is for you and little Akash and Adam, and for all your children who are far away, everyone whom the Lord God calls. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus Christ and confidence of Jesus' promises, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. By water and the power of the Holy Spirit, we are made members of Christ's church and join to Christ's ministry of love, joy, and peace. Let us remember with our own baptism 
as we celebrate Akash Adam's baptism. Julian, question for you. Do you desire that Akash Adam be baptized? Do you? Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith to Akash Adam? Do you? And then for a question to all the members, do we as members of the Church of Jesus Christ promise to guide and nurture Akash Adam by word and deed with love and prayer encouraging them to know and follow Christ and to be faithful members of Christ's Church? Do we all? Praise be to God. Through baptism we enter the covenant God has established. Within this covenant, God gives us new life, guards us from evil, and nurtures us in love. In embracing that covenant, we choose whom we will serve by turning from evil and turning to Jesus Christ. As God embraces you within covenant, I ask you to reject sin, to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, and to confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we baptize. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God. A few more questions, Julian. Do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil in its power in the world? Do you? Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? Do you? Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? Will you? Will you be a faithful member of this congregation? Share in its worship and ministry through your prayers and gifts, your study and service, and so fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Will you? Amen. If you know the Apostles' Creed, you'd be so kind to stand and say it with the church. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And one last prayer before I put my mask back on and baptize Josh Adam. Let us pray. We give you thanks, eternal God, for you nourish and sustain all living things by the gift of water. In the beginning of time, your spirit moved over the watery chaos, calling forth order and life. In the time of Noah, you destroyed evil by the waters of the flood, giving righteousness a new beginning. You led Israel out of slavery through the waters of the sea into freedom of the promised land. In the waters of the Jordan, Jesus was baptized by John and anointed with your spirit. By the baptism of his own death and resurrection, Christ set us free from sin and death and opened the way to eternal life. We thank you, O God, for the waters of baptism. In it, we are buried with Christ in his death. From it, we are raised to share in his resurrection. Through it. We are reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit. Send your Holy Spirit upon Akash Adam this very moment. And all those who witness your good news, your faith, your love, your justice for all of humanity. May we all recommit our lives to following our Lord Jesus Christ. It is in his name we pray. Amen. And Joy, would you bring a caution? Let's make sure everyone can see.
Josh Adams. We've got a lot of water for you. There always is an abundance in Jesus Christ. Josh Adam. Josh Adam, I baptize you in the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One last prayer. Eternal and gracious God, we thank you for the gift of Akash Adam. We thank you for the gift of life and new life in Jesus Christ. May your Holy Spirit nurture him in Jesus' faith from this day and forevermore. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sisters and brothers, please pray with me. A member who has been struggling for about a month now remains in the hospital with some complications. Please keep him in prayer. Another member just had hip surgery this week. He is home. I talked to him and doing quite well and is in good spirits and going through the physical therapy. Another member's son is now cancer-free. Praise be to God for that. Another member asks for prayers for his cousin, who is in the hospital with some severe liver problems. We have a handful of members that have relatives who have had to evacuate from Hurricane Laura, hitting the Gulf Coast here this past uh, Wednesday and Thursday. And please keep all the people in the Gulf Coast in your prayers that we might swiftly be able to respond. A uh, member who has relatives in the Gulf Coast also has a brother in California, who will be harshly affected by the wildfires that are happening there uh, because he has some severe lung problems. So let us keep the people in California in our prayers who are suffering from these massive wildfires and fervently pray that the Holy Spirit send rain to extinguish these fires. Friends, I, I wear a black t-shirt once again to say that not all lives matter until black lives matter. Independent of what the organization stands for. When I say not all lives matter until black lives matter, I believe that Jesus Christ, he himself, would say this. That I believe the church of Jesus Christ believes in a God who rescues slaves, the God of Israel, the story of Exodus. That when I say not all lives matter until black lives matter, when the church says this, we believe in a God who comes to us as Jesus Christ who commands us to stand up for people who are bullied. Certainly, we believe God loves all people, including bullies. But Jesus commands us to evaluate our own souls, to confess the sin that lives in us, and to call out those who are bullies, and to ask them, to examine their souls as well. In our newsletter, there is a 21-day devotion to help us get a deeper understanding of race and our unaware biases. Day three is especially thought-provoking, and I really recommend that you go through this daily devotion. In it, it says that many claim that our children do not see 
race. Watch an updated version of the Clark Dahl experiment, which explores early in life ideas of racial inferiority and superiority that are internalized in our littlest of kiddos. Friends from our national website, the PCUSA.org, it states unequivocally that racism is the opposite of what God intends for humanity. It is the rejection of other which is entirely contrary to the word of God incarnate in Jesus Christ. Racism is a lie about our fellow human beings. For it says that some are less than others. Because of our biblical understanding of who God is and what God intends for humanity, the PCUSA must stand against, speak against, and work against racism. As a part of an ongoing campaign to address racial injustice, the Presbyterian Church USA is sharing a wealth of anti-racism resources including studies, books, and training to equip the greater church against racism. Again, you can go to nolensburgchurch.org, and there are links to get to the national website. There are also links throughout our September newsletter, uh, that 21-day devotion in particular. Sisters and brothers in Christ, let us pray together. Gracious Father, you desire us to be your beloved community. We call upon your Holy Spirit to stand up for those who are bullied. Lord, we know that you still love the bully. But we understand that you ask us to confess to the sin of bullying, to confess to the sin of racism and to call others out if they are the bully. Jesus, we call upon your Holy Spirit to empower all who non-violently protest against injustice and police brutality. Lord, we pray for our good police officers and ask to give them endurance Lord, we pray for our bad police officers and ask that you miraculously transform them into the image of Christ. We pray for the jurors around the country who have case after case after case to try. Holy Spirit, give us courage to continue difficult conversations. By your Holy Spirit, may we stay courageous, compassionate, and kind. We ask that your Holy Spirit blow Hurricane Laura away. May we respond swiftly to the damage Laura has caused. Please send rain to California to extinguish the wildfires there. Protect the firemen and the first responders. Lord, we ask for the healing of Jacob Blake and all those who have suffered under the hand of police brutality, all those who mourn, who have been killed, Lord, reconcile this nation. We pray for our president and our Congress that they may be leaders to reconcile that which is broken. Give them prudence and wisdom to follow the way of Jesus' nonviolent resistance. We pray for our soldiers stationed throughout the world that they may know you and that they may protect liberty and justice for all.
We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, who teaches us to pray by praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, now is the time to commit your life to the way of Jesus Christ. God leads us by offering his life generously to us as Jesus Christ and is calling for you right now to accept Christ as Lord and Savior, to give your time, your talent, your money, to glorify God and to better all of humanity. Please give. Father, please guide us to use these offerings for your ministry and to help minister to others. We thank you for the gift of family and friendships. Please shine on and watch over our children, parents, teachers, and all school workers as they are returning to school. Please keep them safe and healthy. Lord, we call upon you to shine your light upon us to help guide us through life. May your strength and inspiration lift up our spirits so we can continue to spread hope and love. Please continue to bless us as we go through this week. Amen.
Christ-centered community. And in joyful response to Christ's love for us, we worship God. We nurture disciples. We accept all as God's children. Now let us go to continue Jesus' ministry.